ServiceNow Knowledge 14 is sponsored by ServiceNow. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. We're back. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Frick. We're here live at Knowledge 14. This is ServiceNow's big customer event. About 6,600 people, up from about 4,000 last year, as we've been saying. It's kind of tracking the growth of ServiceNow, which has been pretty meteoric. We heard from Mike Scarpelli, the CFO, Frank Slootman. Uh, they're really doubling down, and uh, it's exciting to see. Uh, we're here in, uh, in San Francisco, where all the action is. Jeffrey Moore is here, author, consultant, pundit, all-around smart guy. Cube alum, great Whatever. to see you again. Thanks <laughs> nice for coming to be back. Here. Thanks for being here. So, um, so you're speaking at the CIO decisions. I, I love the fact that they got so many CIOs here. I mean, real CIOs. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, a lot yeah, of times no, these yes. conferences, you get to, you know, the infrastructure guys. But um, so, what's the vibe like over there? Well, you know, it's kind of cool because if you think about ServiceNow and you go back, say, ten years, this was all about how to make IT more productive around the ITIL model, and you mm -hmm. know, and you'd use these automated services to do this stuff. What's happening, and, and Frank nailed it in the keynote, he said, look, this infrastructure can be turned inside out and you can service enable the entire enterprise, not just IT, you can service enterprise, you know, HR, you can service a marketing, a, a, any other shared service you can turn into a bunch of services that you can sort of call in and use ServiceNow as a platform. So, so the CIOs, it was all about, well, that, that's, a different, that's a different vision, and so how do we map from the old way of sort of thinking about this as an internal productivity facility to this new way of saying, no, this is an enterprise enablement platform. And that's a big, that's a big move. It's a little bit like Salesforce going to force.com. It's that same flavor. Yeah, so Frank, in his keynote, was talking about how the CIO has to become you know, more business savvy. And of course, we've heard that a lot for years and years and years. But in fact, a, a number of the folks that we've had on here at ServiceNow are actually of that ilk. Maybe they came from the business, but most CIOs didn't necessarily come from the business. They weren't P&L managers, they weren't running sales. Um, do you see that changing? Yeah, I, I think what happened in the 20th century was IT was sufficiently complex that frankly, you had to be a technical person to do it. It, just, it was just really hard. And, and yes, you needed business consultants, but at the end of the day, you needed 10% business consultants and 90% technical people. I think we've come a long way since then, and the next generation of stuff is more around systems of engagement, these things that, that communicate with each other as opposed to systems of record. And so the profile of the winning IT strategy is migrating from help us run information about our business in the back office to help us actually re-engineer the dynamics of our business in the world, in the present. And that's like going from, from data to behavior. I mean, it's a big, we call it going from systems of record to systems of engagement. It's a big shift. And is that, that transition, I think, in your mind, is very disruptive. Um, so what happens to all those purveyors and buyers of systems of, of engagement? Do they morph into uh, of systems of record? Do they morph into systems of engagement? Or do they just get you know, blown away? No, it, it's interesting. So, so, so first of all, you're never going to get rid of your systems of record. But at the margin, we've probably extracted most of the lifetime value from that investment already. So you need to maintain them. And so the industry is consolidating around a, an anchor set of you know, vendors who we trust to do that. But the growth is going to be, like if you look at systems of engagement, we might have gotten 5% of the lifetime value there. So at the margin, if you have a dollar to spend, people want to spend it in the, there. So the challenge of being a, an incumbent is, I'm not going to lose my base, but man, the growth is happening over here. So the real challenge for the, for the incumbent vendors is how can I participate in the new world and still maintain my relationships in the old world? Whereas the new guys are just coming in and saying, I don't, I, I'll, I'll leave the old world to you guys, I just want to play over here. I got to get your take on the structure of the IT business. Is you've observed, uh, as have I, um, sort of these disruptions and these changes over time. So obviously when we went from mainframe to PC, you saw the the, c the competitive lines started to get more disintegrated, yeah. if I could use that, that term. And competition occurred on those. I see at Intel's ascendancy and Microsoft and Oracle, the best database company, and, and EMC was the storage company. And, and everything was sort of you know, siloed. Um, and, and, but leadership, the, the leadership matrix has largely stayed intact. I mean, even IBM and okay, HP's had its, had its up and down. Um, but it's largely stayed intact. Do you see the cloud changing that, the fundamentally changing the, the economics. Yeah, so I think, well, yeah, yes, I think what's happened is, so in the client server era, we did, we built the stack, what you just described, and every layer of the stack had a leader, mm -hmm. 
Now, I think since 2000 Y2K, that stack is being compressed, meaning there are fewer and fewer vendors that are still in, the, in, that, in that leadership cadre. And as we go to like cloud and computing as a service, you start saying, well, yeah, I still have Cisco in there, I still have IBM in there, but maybe I'm buying them as a service rather than as a, a set of uh, equipment. So you kind of can feel that world just, I, I think compressing is, 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 is the right word. And whereas the experimentation, the opportunity to sort of find new places to go to, it's very much in this world that out board of the, of the IT data center where it's, it is about engaging, engaging with your customer, engaging with your employee, engaging with your supply chain, and using mobile things and social and you know, analytics and cloud and all these new technologies, the freedom to do that is, is actually outboard of, of, the, of the old style uh, IT. So you, what you described is sort of an oligopoly and you got these big whales, yep. and I'm always asking you know, guys who, who follow this, are we going to see somebody d d disrupt that? Amazon is the obvious yep. one. You got a, yep. a three billion dollar you know company growing at sixty percent a year, uh, with marginal economics of services that look like software. Yep. Um, but at the same time, you say, okay, they've got this huge lead, but it, 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 it doesn't just make sense to me that it's sustainable. I mean, because hardware economics never will go to zero. Um, so you would think that somebody would say, almost like the IBM early PC days. Remember IBM had yep, the lead yep, and yep, they yep, were yep. dominant player. That's kind of what kind of way Amazon is now. Do you do you do you see that? Do you see more competition from Amazon? Why is it that they they don't have wow. um, direct competition? So the la the la so the last book I wrote and the last the thing I've been working on most recently is around why is it so hard for the established incumbents to catch the next wave? And, and the problem is so you look at why Amazon's why is Amazon so unopposed in many of its initiatives? Well, their business model and their economic model is completely divorced from the incumbent model. And so you look at the incumbents and they're going, it's not that I don't see what the guys are doing, I get what they're doing, I just don't see how I can get my investors or my, my, my whole infrastructure onto that new place. And the, my example of that was Kodak. So, you know, Antonio Perez came from HP. He knew what he was getting into. He understood digital. Everybody at Kodak understood digital, but they couldn't get to the other place. So this, it, we call it escape velocity. How do you free yourself from your own past? And you, you really do have to take a pretty dramatic approach to it. And I think, by the way, I think I'm looking at Microsoft in particular. I think, it, I think Microsoft's going to give a very, very big run at, at doing that. And, but I think that they're still more the exception than the rule. You would wish that every one of those vendors would say, look, you know, because every CIO here, if, 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 if any of those vendors came to them and said, hey, we're going to really try to play here, will you help? They'd say yes. They don't want to change their relationships. But, but we get trapped in these business models and, then, and, and then, it, then you sort of grind and you grind and you grind and after a while it's like, well, man, you've just ground yourself into a hole. <laughs> right, it's classic Clayton Christensen, right, Innovator's Dilemma. And, and it also begs the question, as you said, David, it's been the same characters kind of changing companies. Had not Jeff Bezos and Amazon come in with a completely different model to drive cloud, would the other people well, so, have so transferred? The, so the would people you want to give credit to, you want to give credit to Bezos, you want to give credit to Benioff. By the way, Benioff has been, has, has been the kind of the prow of a ship that brings in Anil Boozeri at Workday, brings in NetSuite, brings in service, ServiceNow. You know, so the software as a service thing is coming in at one level. And remember, if you were an on-premise guy, how do you, how do you move? It's very, very, I mean, how many years did, but did SAP commit an enormous amount of money to say we're going to have a great cloud offering? And it just, it's so hard. So, so, I, so, and then you're looking now at these sort of, the, this next layer of collaborative IT, and you're seeing Box and Okta and Ping, and all these cool things, and Analytics and Splunk and Simologic, and all these companies going, really? I mean, I, you know, I mean, if, if, if my age is like, okay, you know, do you have a t-shirt? I mean, I mean, <laughs> they got a lot of t-shirts. <laughs> they got a lot of t-shirts. <laughs> but, 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 but the point is, this free space, and they're saying, there's these cool problems to solve. We're not encumbered by any of the legacy. We're going to race ahead. And so if you're a CIO, and what we spent most of our time with the CIOs today was, okay, I have established set of relationships here. I'm not going to abandon them, but at the margin, I need them to help me think about the future. I've got these really start sparkly new startups. Some I'm, I'm sure not going to exist next year, but some are going to be the leaders. So how, how do I play that game right now? And, and the pressure it's putting on the IT organization is the people I know that are good at this 
are not the people that are good at this. Right. And so how do I, so we had talked about talent and, and, and how do you manage and how do you create career paths and, and is, you know, and do you have an infrastructure officer versus an innovation office? I mean, it was all around that same problem. Right, and then, oh, by the way, there's Hadoop and mobile and big data and some of these other just open source innovations that are being just thrown on these guys' plate. It is, so from a technology plate, from a technology plate, if you're a technologist, it's like, bring it on, right? Right. The, the, I think the interesting thing is, in most of my career, IT was about the business. So you, you ran a business and you had IT systems which gave you information about your business. What's happened in the last 15 years is that more and more sectors of the economy IT is becoming the business. So, so, so you saw what happened in newspapers. So it, what, I, IT isn't about the newspaper business. IT is displacing the newspaper business. Google is displacing the media business. Amazon is displacing retail. You know, mobile banking is displacing banking. Airbnb, Uber. I mean, so now we got the taxi guys worried. And, they, and, and so you start saying, it isn't, IT isn't about the business. It's a digital world. And, and so all of us, and that, that was, at, I think that was probably at the core of the discussion. So right. which CIO am, am I, what do I have permission to be? Which, do my colleagues get this? You know, am I competent to do it if they do? Right. I mean. You've talked about this a lot and you've given a number of examples. So, so was Nick Carr just dead wrong in 2003? Or, or, or was he just too well, narrow in his focus? He, he, what he was saying, I believe, is that systems of record yeah, okay. are dead. I think, I, I think at that time, by the way, it wasn't obvious there was anything else. Yeah. Because, it, no, seriously, I can remember, you know, the whole oh. venture community kind of abandoned IT for about you six or seven years. Drive up and down 101, yeah. it was yeah, yeah, a yeah, ghost yeah. town. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was. <laughs> yeah. and, even in the inf and even in the physical infrastructure, there's still, the IT is the basis of the competitive advantage, yeah. not the reporting yeah. system. Yeah, and, and I think this issue about, so I think there are still a few businesses where really IT still is about the business. And, and you know what? You can kind of stick with whatever you were doing. You'll be okay. But if your business is under an existential threat, meaning the new IT model eviscerates your business model, which arguably you could say all those 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 incumbent stack vendors, you know, I mean, cloud does eviscerate the on-premise hardware data center business model, which was the fundamental foundation of IT as I knew it for all my business career. And now all of a sudden it's like, holy, how do I, how do I, uh, how do I deal with that? So we talk about Amazon as a potential, you know, new, you know, big whale. Uh, Salesforce is obviously, it's kind of, but they've been around since '99, so there's kind of the exception that, mm -hmm. you know, proves the rule. Um, I don't, maybe a service now or, or, or a workday. You know, we'll see if this market is big enough. It looks like it, it might be. What what often happens is they, these guys just get gobbled up. Or Larry Ellison writes a check. He, remember, yeah. he used yeah. to say he used to denigrate people who write. Write checks, not code, and then he became the biggest check, check writer. writer. <laughs> and well, they got such massive. He's never been words. afraid to reinvent himself. No, you absolutely have to say not. That you about got I mean, it's, He changed the game, right? Yeah, yeah, he changed yeah. the dynamics yeah. of the industry. Yeah. So, do you think we will see a, 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 another big player, and where will that come from? Will it be the SaaS guys? Will it be the, some of the guys out okay. of the Hadoop world? So, or? what I don't think it will. So, here, here's what I don't think will work. I don't think you can be an established incumbent vendor under this compression power and write a check and get yourself out. I think what happens when you write a check is you just bring a hot property into cold molecules and it loses its thermal. <laughs> it's equilibrium. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I don't think that will work. I think if you want to be one of these incumbents and succeed over here, you have to actually pull part of your own DNA and capability and re literally just jump and, and then I think you can acquire it to, to, to build a thing there. But, th but what Larry did was he consolidated. He basically was the first guy to figure out, Nick Carr is right, mm. I need to buy up all the properties yep. and, 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 run and, the more. Yeah, and run a maintenance <laughs> business. Which by the way- Paint them red and charge yeah, more. Well, computer <laughs> associates had that playbook yeah. in the 80s. Yep. It's right. the same playbook. Right. This is a different playbook. Well, I love what you're saying. Yeah. And, and, and EMC is an interesting one to watch, the way Tucci is setting up this federation with Pivotal and VMware, and you know, we'll, see, we'll see what happens with the core EMC. And I think, I, think very that, innovative. Yeah, I think that that is, I mean, VMware is one of the wonderful examples of an, where a company did not cause the hot molecules to become the cold molecules. Mm -hmm. The thing you wonder there, though, is it feels a little bit like a, like a holding company, if you will. Yep. And so, and, and by the way, VMware is in a curious tweener, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they kind of were the most 
they, they made the old stack incredibly productive. So in some sense, they can feel like they're part of the old world, right? Now, they're probably the newest kid on the old world, but then you think, well, yeah, but I want to, if you look at their plan now, they want to be into software-defined networks, they want to be into software-defined data centers, they definitely want to play over here. And well, it's, it's an escape it's velocity so do all their problem. partners. And, and, and arguably, they created the cloud, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. One could argue that that was they, the basis they, they, of what they, became they, the cloud, right? Yeah, yeah. Virtualized computing. Absolutely, absolutely. So what are you working on these days that's exciting? Well, so the, I think this issue of working with management teams to say, okay, look, this is a self-imposed exile that we're putting ourselves under. You know, we, we, we get it, I'll call it the Kodak problem because I don't want to talk about anybody in high tech specifically at the moment, but the point is every management team in the established vendor group puts itself in a self-imposed discipline to make, you know, certain kinds of EPS things, certain kinds of growth, you know, whatever it is, the, the expectations of their investors. And you look at the situation and you say, guys, that is a slow glide path to extinction. We all know that. And by the way, off the record, they know it too. No, <laughs> totally, totally, totally. This, this is not that, that is this is not a failure of intellect. This is a failure of will. So then the question is, well, so how do you negotiate a, a different path? And part of it is you have to you, you have to be able to tell a story to your investors. Part of it is you have to negotiate a different operating model inside the company. And what they've done so far is they said, well, okay, we've got our established businesses and we've got our innovative businesses, and we know enough to keep them apart, so that, that part is not the problem. And they actually come up with cool stuff. The, the, the moment of truth is when, can you scale any of these innovative businesses to compete, to actually be a material part of your historical portfolio? Meaning, in my, my terminology, at least 10% of your total revenue going to 20%. And what happens in that journey is that a key point, you have to draw on the resources of your established business and all the people that make their living and they're compensated on getting the next quarter and the next quarter go, guys, I can't make the quarter and do this. And you've got you've to find a way to say, you know, if we don't figure out a way to pull some of that resource over here and play our next hand, we'll, we'll invent everything in the world, but we'll never get it to scale. And so there's a, there's a bunch of stuff around business model planning and, and, and then investor relations, organizational development. And it's all around saying, and the key, there's two key ideas. Idea number one is it's a go-to-market problem, not an R&D problem. You do not have an innovation problem. You can't get your thing to market. And the second um, uh, cool idea is you can only do one at a time. And everybody says, well, but the, the risk is so high. You got to three or four or five of these things maybe want to work. It's like, no. The sacrifice is so great. If you put two or more horses in the race, people people won't even run. So tough those, one. That's those right. Are, those you are got, tough. Yeah, focus and don't, it's okay not to make the quarter. That's like on American. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> well, then you look at like Michael Dell, right? I mean, that's ostensibly yeah. what he's hoping to yeah. be able to do. And, and 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 I think one of the reasons you see people go private is to say, I can't play this game by by normal public company protocol. I mean, I I'd like to, but I can't get there from here. Now. I actually don't think every company ought to have to go private to do this, but I think they do have to change their playbook. All right, Jeff, we have to leave it there. Hey, great to see you. Thanks nice very much. We, we feel it. smarter just hanging Jeff, out with you. Thanks. Thanks. All right, okay. keep Take it right care. there, everybody. We'll be right back after this. This is theCUBE.